Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. Americans like to think of themselves as a frontier people. Even if we live in cities, we like to imagine ourselves as part of a country that includes wide open expanses, massive mountain peaks, and dense wild forests. We may not always want to go explore them, but we like to know that they're still there. And as a people, Americans share lands that are set aside for this purpose, the national parks and forests. We very well could not have those forests in open lands if it wasn't for a confluence of events and several very interesting and committed characters in the late 19th century. In an era where industry was largely unregulated, cities were growing at a dizzying rate, and most people took the environment for granted, conservationists of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era had the foresight to recognize that America's natural beauty should be protected for future generations. Today, we're talking about the conservation movement of the late 19th and early 20th century. I'm Sarah. And I'm Elizabeth. And we are your historians for this episode of DIG. Americans have always believed that what set them apart from Europeans was their access to undeveloped land. White colonists enjoyed access to land that their European ancestors never had. Land ownership was limited to elites in Great Britain. Unlike their ancestors in Europe, American colonists could purchase land at reasonable rates or were given tracts of land in exchange for keeping the land productive. Colonial New Englanders traditionally subdivided family farms to give their children their own land. And after a few generations, when they had started to run out of land, all they had to do was move westward to the plentiful, cheap, and fertile lands in New York and Pennsylvania. And as the population in the East grew, Americans were comforted with the knowledge that there was always some place to go, some place wild and untamed. Easterners loved to read and learn about the Western wilderness, whether it was travel narratives of explorers like Lewis and Qua- Clark. Lewis and Quark. Clark. Clark. That's the Star Quark. Trek Deep Space Nine version. <laughs> Like Lewis and Clark, memoirs of men who went west to seek their fortune in the gold rush, or stories about the U.S. Army's clashes with Native Americans or outlaws like Jesse James. But starting in the mid-19th century, the federal government, under pressure from naturalists and conservationists, began to see the western wildernesses a little differently. Rather than simply inexhaustible resources to be exploited or sold off to fill the government coffers, like other public lands through the 1830s and 40s, certain lands became understood as national treasures. In 1864, Abraham Lincoln took the first steps in American history to protect land when he signed the Yosemite Grant. In 1872, Ulysses S. Grant signed a bill making Yellowstone the first official national park. Over the next decades, the federal government set aside more and more land to be protected in the name of the American people. Although the federal government began to slowly set aside land as nationally owned, they were slower to decide quite what to do with the lands once it was set aside. In American culture, land was ultimately considered valuable, not because it was beautiful or ecologically important, but because it was potentially productive. One of the major conflicts, and please note that I say one of the, because it is one of many, including um, racism, but one of the conflicts between white Americans and Native Americans was over the perception that Native Americans were wasting their land. Removing Native people from their land and limiting them to reservations was in part an effort to seize their land, take the Cherokee removal in Georgia or the removal of the Nez Perce in the Wallowa Valley in Oregon or the Lakota Sioux in the Black Hills of South Dakota, for example. Each region was coveted by whites because the land had potential, whether for agriculture or mining or just for white settlement, and was considered as being wasted by Indians. But in the 19th century, Americans began to realize that their natural resources were not inexhaustible. 
The business practices of the Gilded Age barons of industry, coupled with their incessant pursuit of entertainment in the form of hunting, fishing, and the building of luxurious mansions, all took a serious toll on the environment. Gilded Age Americans tried to extract a product from the land in a number of ways, producing crops, mined for minerals, or cleared to make way for factories. But it could also be productive without Americans doing much of anything except taking what was already there timber. Wood was in constant demand in the U.S. and abroad, especially in countries that did not have the standing old-growth forests that America had. In states with large forests, logging quickly grew from small scale at the beginning of the century to a massive industry controlled by a few wealthy and powerful timber barons by the 1870s. But these timber barons saw America's forests as nothing but sources of wealth. Loggers exhausted the hardwood of one area, then abandoned it and moved on to the next, leaving the less valuable trees. Often, when loggers felled trees, they left behind extra branches and debris that easily caught fire. A series of fires in the 1880s destroyed something like half a million acres of woodland a year in Wisconsin. Of course, cutting timber also had soil consequences, leading to erosion and floods on lands unprotected by the trees that usually held their land. By the end of the 19th century, it was becoming clear to everyone except the timber barons that something needed to change or America's forests would be in critical danger. I just read uh, Rebecca Edwards, what is it, what is it, A New Spirit? Uh -huh. or, um, and I love how she starts that chapter on fires. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that kind of... I didn't look at that one, but oh, I yeah. like that book. That's a really good I, book. I had never read it before, but yeah, I just like how she starts the whole chapter with all of these fires going on, because I'd yeah. never heard of all these these fires in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I had never really, I think that I had, because I, I did read that. I must have heard of them before, but I didn't realize the, um, I don't know, I guess I thought about forest fires as sort of like, because it seems like we've had really severe forest fires in the past several years. Mm -hmm. And so I, I always kind of thought of them as like, a modern thing mm -hmm. but yeah i mean they were there was tons of forest fires in the 1880s yeah which i don't know i guess kind of makes sense because you had the same type of like decimation mm -hmm. of of natural old forests right, right? yeah in 1881, the Division of Forestry was established within the Department of Agriculture, although it was often left with a shoestring budget that made it difficult to do anything of much significance. Timber conservation, however, made a major step forward in 1891 with the passage of a rider on a civil service bill. The rider was called the Forest Reserve Act, which set aside 1.2 million acres to be the Yellowstone Forest Reserve and another 1.2 million uh, acres in Colorado, which became the White River Forest Reserve, each protecting forested lands around a national park. Two years later, President Benjamin Harrison set aside another 13 million acres. But the reserves were created with no real plan. No steps were taken to protect the forests from timber theft, fire, or destruction from roaming livestock. In the 1890s, the National Forestry Commission was created to take stock of public forest lands. It was headed by a man named Gifford Pinchot. And I'm assuming it's pronounced Pinchot. It might be Pinchot. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to forward ahead. those names you're always like, e she written. Right. But. Yeah, exactly. I've never heard someone say it out yeah. loud. Um, so it was headed by a man named Gifford Pinchot, who was born into an incredibly wealthy family. His family got their wealth from being um, wallpaper manufacturers and sellers, which I hmm. think is really interesting. Um, and his family was very into environmentalism and conservation, and he was encouraged to become a forester by his father. Mm. Because there were no real forestry schools in the United States, he traveled to France to study. When he returned home, he eventually made his way to the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina, which was built by George Vanderbilt, where he managed the forest surrounding the mansion. And that in and of itself is something that I would love to learn more about. I had no idea until I read this that Biltmore now has kind of the foremost forestry school in the oh. country. And they, the Pinchot and his work at the forests around... Uh, Biltmore, uh -huh. like, revolutionized scientific forestry in the United States. Wow. I had no idea. I just think that's fascinating. No, it is fascinating. My in-laws live, like, 30 minutes from the yeah. Biltmore Mansion. I haven't been yet, though. Anyway, it's beautiful out there. Yeah, I really would like to go. 
Pinchot and the Forestry Commission were tasked with studying the status of public lands. What they found was fairly disheartening. In South Dakota, they discovered that mining and illegal logging had deforested huge swaths of land. In Wyoming, they found forests destroyed by fire. In Oregon, sheep had been allowed to roam free and chewed their way through the local plant life until it was essentially gone. Clearly, the commission was going to need to make some changes or America's forests were never going to recover. However, that was easier said than done. After completing their study, the commission was ready to report on their findings and make a recommendation to the president. But first, they had to agree on what to recommend. This was not easy. The commission split into two factions, the preservationists, led by naturalist John Muir, and the conservationists, led by Gifford P- Pinchot. P- Pinchot. Pinchot. See, I always want to say Pinochet. Oh. So obviously, not, that's that's in my head what I always read. So. Right. Okay. <laughs> John Muir was a Scottish-born naturalist who traveled extensively through the United States during the 1870s, writing books and numerous articles for Century Magazine describing the beauty and remote locations that many Americans would had never seen and and would likely never be able to travel and see. For instance, in his article "The Treasure of Yosemite," he wrote this. No temple made with hands can compare with Yosemite. Every rock in its walls seems to glow with life. Some lean back in majestic repose, others absolutely sheer or nearly so for thousands of feet, advance beyond their companions in thoughtful attitudes, giving welcome to storms and calms alike, seemingly conscious yet heedless of everything going on about them. Awful and stern, immovable majesty, how softly these mountain rocks are adorned and how fine and reassuring the company they keep. Their feet set in groves and gay emerald meadows, their brows in the thin blue sky, a thousand flowers leaning confidingly against their adamantine bosses, bathed in floods with booming water, floods of light, while snow, clouds, winds, avalanches shine and sing and wreathe about them as the years go by. So it was writing like this that put the initial pressure on the federal government to protect places like Yosemite and Yellowstone. Um, Because people read what he published in these magazines and read his books. They were incredibly popular. And they were able to describe these lands that most Americans would never see um, in such a way that made them feel connected to them, made them want to protect them, even though they didn't actually have any association with them whatsoever. It's very sentimental. Yeah, absolutely. In 1892, Muir helped to found and became the first president of the Sierra Club, which advocated for the protection of places like Yosemite. So he was known for this kind of work, and that's why he ended up on the Forestry Commission. Muir and Pinchot, who had previously been friends, had very different ideas about how to care for America's forests. Muir saw the national forests as literally sacred. He often described them in terms of cathedrals and churches. His recommendation was that the forest be protected without exception, with soldiers tasked with guarding the forest from poachers and illegal loggers. In fact, just a few years before, the cavalry had been deployed to Yosemite and Yellowstone to stop poaching and had been very successful. So this wasn't as ridiculous as it sounds. Can I pause you for one second? Absolutely. When I first read this, I was reading it in a book that was like a synthetic sort of history. So it didn't go into the background of his argument for using the military to Uh guard the fort and i was like what a stupid idea like to me i just like initially i was like that's a totally ridiculous idea and then i was like actually let me look into this for a second and i did some research and the cavalry really was tasked with protecting yellowstone and they were the first people out there before there were forest rangers or national well yeah i mean i guess that's but I mean, I'm surprised that that would seem weird to you because who else is going to do it? Exactly. (laughs) Afterwards, I was like, oh, actually, that makes perfect sense. And they made a huge difference in the history of Yellowstone. But initially, I was like, oh, what a what a pie in the sky idea to have like the military protecting this park. Um, But the reason he suggested it is because it had literally just worked at Yellowstone. Okay, all right. But Pinchot was a forester and thought about caring for forests in terms of farming. Forestry was about scientifically managing trees, which required new planting, harvesting, and the occasional clearing. Without it, Pinchot argued, the forests would actually suffer. 
Uh, and side note, this was actually the way that most American forests had always been managed. When colonists first arrived in New England, for example, they discovered that the forests were clear and easy to walk through. This wasn't because they grew this way, but because Native Americans practiced controlled burns to manage undergrowth. Um, so instead of the cavalry guarding the forests, Pinchot envisioned a new force of civilian foresters, trained specifically in the care and management of trees. In addition, these foresters would help to ensure that the forests were open to responsible logging and other industries. In the end, the conservationists had the most influence on the report, and when it hit President Cleveland's desk in 1897, he took it seriously. He set aside an additional 21.3 million acres for national forests and parks. The move was immediately unpopular with those who wanted to keep those lands open to mining, hunting, and logging, and the whole issue devolved into a political mess. At, at one point in the you know, late 1890s, Republicans even tried to draft articles of impeachment against Cleveland because of his refusal to deal with the Western industries that wanted access to this land. In 1898, Pinchot was named the first director of the Division of Forestry. After the assassination of President McKinley, Pinchot worked under President Theodore Roosevelt, who had long been an ardent, an ardent conservationist, as we discuss in, in Elizabeth's episode about, um, um, what's it called? The Rise of National Natural History Museum. Right, about um, that, natural history. <laughs> about, um, about yeah, natural history museums. Um <laughs> So in 1905, with Roosevelt's support, Pinchot finally succeeded in creating that organization that he had wanted um, that would become known as the U.S. Forest Service. And so um, I just I just have to say that um, a large part of my own personal research um, on Union veterans after the Civil War has to do with President Cleveland being a complete a Hole, um, and how he was just kind of terrible when it came to pensions, and he was always trying to cut pensions, pension spending, and yeah. I just have become a really, um, uh, I've become sort of a opponent of President Cleveland. Like yeah. I just don't like him. Don't He's like I don't like him at all. He was kind of mm -hmm. I always thought of him as a jerk, and. And here's another and reason it, for you to hate him. Well, no, here's <laughs> actually here is a reason for me to to be kind of impressed with him because he did set aside all of this extra land, more land, and kind of um, got pushback from the people who in my work are typically the good guys, mm -hmm. the Republicans, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I thought that was really, really okay. interesting. And it reminded me that I have to treat all historical accurate actors with nuance. There you go. So serves me right. Serves you right. There you go. You learned your lesson today. I did. Okay. I did. Uh, Roosevelt was also able to secure more protection for America's natural resources than any other president. In 1906, he signed the Antiquities Act, which allowed the president to preserve historic areas, such as those in desert states that included Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. Um, and these included ancient artifacts from Native Americans or just other places of scientific importance. Since then, this precedent has been used to preserve other historic sites from battlefields like Gettysburg to the Stonewall Inn. But like with the District of Forestry, the problem was enforcement. The president could set aside the land, but there was no agency designated to actually protect those lands in a kind of boots on the ground scenario. Um, this became very clear in 1913 when city officials from San Francisco built a dam in the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite to provide the city with water. John Muir called this akin to a rape. The next year, rich outdoorsman Stephen Mather complained to the Secretary of Interior Franklin Lane hard about the abuses of public lands. Lane decided to let Mather solve the problem and appointed him assistant to the Secretary of the Interior for Park Matters. Isn't that amazing? Like, a rich white guy is like, hey, we should do something about this problem. And he's like, yes. okay, here's a government job. Here's your secretary right. ship. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Mather lobbied hard for a specific agency to care for the parks, appealing to the public with lavish publications and articles in magazines like National Geographic. 
it worked. In 1916, President Woodrow Wilson signed a bill creating the National Parks Service, created to, quote, conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein, and to provide for enjoyment in manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. And again, I don't really like Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> Not my favorite president, but again, this is a good thing. Yeah, but I mean, they're just signing these things. It's not like they're actually That's true. doing the work. Fine, fine, fine. I hate <laughs> I hate Cleveland and Woodrow Wilson again. Woodrow Wilson had one of the highest IQs of any president. Yeah, too bad he used it in shitty ways. <laughs> Evil ways. Like, like screening Birth of a Nation in the White House. Yeah. He, was, he was such a weird character, too. His wife died, right? And he remarried that young woman. In office. And then he had a stroke and then his wife was effectively the president of the United States, which is really yeah. and interesting. Knew. Right. Yeah. As the effort to protect the nation's forests were was evolving in the late 19th century, many Americans were also becoming increasingly concerned with preserving the country's wildlife. There had been some small scale efforts to protect game in some states prior to this. New York State, for instance, created its first wildlife conservation law in 1846. This law it is really early, I know. This law restricted hunting and fishing to seasons and controlled the sale of hunted birds. This was especially in response to fashion crazes that required enormous quantities of feathers. Through the middle of the 19th century, it was hunting clubs like the New York Sportsman's Club, later um, named the New York Association for the Protection of Game, that lobbied state governments to pass laws designed to protect and preserve the country's wildlife. At the turn of the century, hunting clubs, especially in eastern states like Pennsylvania and New York, began protecting wildlife not by trying to pass laws that would preserve wildlife for all citizens, but by creating private wildlife preserves accessible only to the most wealthy. And, of course, the most white. Yes. Of course. Right. Of course. Take, for example, the Blooming Grove Park, created out of 18,000 acres of land in eastern Pennsylvania. The park was created by the Blooming Grove Park Association, made up of hmm, white, wealthy <laughs> right. men from New York City who were impressed by the grandeur of exclusive European hunting parks. Blooming Grove was designed oh, um, not necessarily to create uh, a protection for wildlife. The park was created um, and enforced its own hunting regulations and allowed hunters to take enormous amounts of game. To ensure that the park always had enough game for its clients, rather than restricting hunting, the park started to stock game, raising birds, fish, and other critters to ensure a healthy population. Blooming Grove also employed game experts who carefully tracked animal populations, using a system of sustained yield to ensure they didn't overhunt, even with the large quotas hunters were allowed. Um, and we'll just say sustained yield, it means to track populations to calculate how many animals you can kill in a year without affecting the population. Right. And this is exactly what um, game laws do in New York State and I'm sure in other states as well. Um, where they track the population, say, of white-tailed deer in a given year, and then they issue the hunting quotas based on that. So, like, oh, we need the, you know, the doe population is really, really high this year. We're going to issue extra doe tags, whatever. Um, okay. Similar clubs were established in the Adirondack Mountain region in upstate New York. Wealthy men, <laughs> white wealthy men generally what? from New York no. City, I know, right, um, <laughs> paid for exclusive memberships in clubs like the Bisbee Club and the Adirondack League, which controlled hundreds of thousands of acres of land in the Adirondack wilderness. These preserves were carefully guarded and posted with signs to keep local residents off the land and away from the game. This was both good and bad. It meant that outsiders from the big city controlled huge portions of land in the region, adding little to the local economy except for some seasonal labor. But at the same time, it actually helped to protect and conserve wildlife in the Adirondacks because parks were more because parks more carefully tracked game populations, kept the streams stocked with raised fish, and generally had stricter hunting laws than the surrounding regions. So there was a lot of conflict with locals, but they also, in some cases, were doing a good thing for the environment of the region. Mm -hmm. 
Private hunting clubs could, however, have seriously negative impacts on local communities. Steel barons in Pittsburgh purchased a tract of land near an old reservoir and dam that was no longer really being used outside of Pittsburgh. And they built a private clubhouse and cabins called the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. They also decided to refill and expand the reservoir without any guidance or regulation from state authorities. The reservoir was essentially privately owned and operated. The relationship between the club and the locals was mixed. Some people were glad to have the club in the area because it provided jobs. Others were happy to have it in the area because the newly expanded and stocked dam was teeming with fish. Locals snuck on the club grounds at night to poach. But starting in 1885, other locals started to complain when the reservoir started to periodically flood, damaging neighboring farms. In 1889, a particularly bad rainstorm doused the town of Johnstown, neighbor to the lodge, with eight inches of rain. The sudden rain caused the dam to break, and Johnstown was deluged. In the end, the flood killed 2,209 people. Oh my god, that's a I lot. I know, I know. Uh, and did $17 million in damage. And what it and what we think is particularly tragic about the Johnstown flood, aside, of course, from the staggering loss of life, is that in their quest to preserve a natural resource for themselves, they caused a natural disaster for others. Right. Um, and I just want to note that one of those steel barons that helped to create the South Fork Hunting and Fishing Club was Henry Clay Frick, who was um, Andrew Carnegie's kind of second oh. in command. Um, so, again... To me, this is um, this is a really important moment in um, sort of Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh history, where you see, again, a conflict between the wealthy white steel barons and the people who are actually living and working in those regions. Yeah. Some of them, you know, working for those steel factories. So Frick was the one that told the Pinkertons to fire on exactly. the homestead strikers. Yeah, he was that tough guy. Yeah. He was also the guy that got shot yeah, right. uh, by an attempted assassin and then, like, tackled the guy <laughs> while he was like also being stabbed or something just absolutely crazy it, he was a really interesting guy he also um, had a really amazing art collection yes though. yeah yeah and now yeah. there's um a museum with it yes I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which is so weird america's so weird uh life is weird uh, henry clay Money frick. Is what weird. a freaking frick okay frick 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 but one of the greatest ecological disasters of the Gilded Age was the near extinction level hunting of the bison in the American West. But while this seems like a clear problem to us, you know, over hunting, it wasn't actually to Americans of the late 19th century. So just to give you an idea of the scale that we were talking about, and again, this is also something that I think Elizabeth mentioned um, in the episode about about museums, um, that um, this decimation of the buffalo during this time period. But just to give you some numbers here, in the 1500s, when Europeans first arrived in the Americas, there were an estimated 25 to 30 million buffalo. By 1890, there were likely only 100 left living in the wild. That's how close we came to exterminating the buffalo completely. Bison. Running... Should we say bison? Why? Because they're not buffalo. But they call we call them buffalo. <laughs> I Why, call them <laughs> Elizabeth? Why? I call them interchangeably but bison and buffalo in this I'm, section. I'm, I'm giving you I a know. hard time. No, it's 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 it makes me nauseous to think about it. It, it really does. I mean, it's it's unbelievable um, to and, me. And that was something that that Tr actually wrote about, like in his first like forays west. That he was like, I missed it. He was bummed out because yes. he had missed all the big game. Like, yeah. it was visible to him that, that just these these big animals were nowhere to be right. seen. You know? And what I think is really interesting about that, too, is now, um, you know, you can do some big game hunting in the United States if, you're, if your big idea of big game is bear. Right. Um, but, you know, we've driven, after driving the buffalo out, or, or killing them, I should say, more accurately, in order to go big game hunting these white wealthy guys start going to Africa right. and that has good and bad um, effects in Africa. You know, it, it, it also damages their um, economy or excuse me, it damages their um, animal populations, but it also adds a lot of money to local economies. Um, and I'm saying this as someone who has family members who have gone on safaris in Africa. So um, 
you know, it's it's a it's a mixed bag here. And it's all sort of weirdly interconnected, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. TR well, himself went to Africa right. to go big game hunting. And by the progressive era, the same thing was happening with big game in Africa. And that's why yeah. like yeah. they were trying to get these perfect specimens of like elephants, African elephants, yeah. because they were afraid that they were going to soon be gone as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting to me, too, that their effort was to get specimens, not necessarily to preserve, preserve them right. in terms of putting in game laws. Right. Right. Um, but yeah. then people like Carl Aki then kind of started to yeah. awaken to that. Right. right? And yeah. started working on behalf of, of conservation lands and things like that. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, <laughs> tangent. So, coming back to this here about the <laughs> buffalo, about the, uh, excuse me, the bison, um, <laughs> the buffalo bisons. No, that's baseball team. Okay. Uh, many conservationists were, of course, horrified by the decimation of the buffalo. But at the same time, many also believed that this was a necessary evil. Roaming herds of buffalo made it impossible for the lands of the West to be productive. And again, ultimately, that was the goal, even for people who were committed to, you know, yeah. caring for the environment. Um, buffalo were a danger to trains. They were a nuisance to travelers. A, a, a big herd of buffalo could stop a train for days mm. on the tracks um, because they couldn't get them to move. <laughs> um, and... Um, and I, I read something really fascinating um, that was also about another reason why there was support for this des- real decimation of the buffalo was that the the buffalo became sort of interchangeable with Native Americans in white hunters' mindsets. Mm-hmm. Um, that these people that were moving across the West saw, I mean, obviously Plains Indians needed the buffalo to survive. So in that way, they were linked. But they also saw them as every buffalo you killed was helping to get Native Americans out, out of the, the picture. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so they were sort of inextricably linked. So mm-hmm. the more you decimated the buffalo, the easier it would be to clear the, the yeah. region of Native Americans, which is really sickening. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, bison also stood in the way of agricultural progress, um, particularly cattle ranch nests. So eliminating them made sense, even to the most ardent environmentalists. Even John Muir, who usually decried overhunting, wrote in 1901, I supposed I suppose we need not go mourning the buffaloes. In the nature of things, they had to give place to better cattle, though the change might have been made without barbarous wickedness. Theodore Roosevelt, who formed the Boone and Crockett Club in 1887 for the purpose of protecting America's natural resources, believed that the buffalo had to go to make the way to make way for white settlement. He was most of them were sort of sad mm-hmm. about the the destruction of the buffalo, wished that there, something else could have happened, um, but ultimately so it saw it as inevitable. Yeah. yeah. And just as a side note, um, John Muir. Um, actually reserved his most scathing terms about hunting when the people doing the hunting were not white. He was very critical of Native Americans that he witnessed on on one of his trips once who were killing mountain goats. Um, And again, taken devoid of any context of why or the traditions of hunting or any of that, um, he just saw that as a desecration. Mm. And I think that that's really telling that he ultimately supported white people killing the buffalo but criticized Native Americans when they killed animals that they traditionally killed. Right. So once the buffalo were all but driven out of existence by the 1890s, the American Bison Society started an effort to restock the buffalo, but only in carefully controlled ways. Bison preserves were created in Oklahoma, Montana, South Dakota, and Nebraska to breed buffalo, not to reintroduce them into the wild to roam the plains again, but to be kept on ranches and in zoos. The society called its efforts a success, but also turned a blind eye to ranchers who raised buffalo only to sell rich dudes the right to hunt them and other mass killings of bison, determined to be a nuisance to cattle. By the 1930s, the American Bison Society disbanded, not having really done much to bring back the American bison population. Right. It's not until fairly recently, right, that there's been an effort to reintroduce bison into um, the American West and have kind of try to build up herds that are actually free roaming again. Um and in the 1930s, that was certainly not the case. When yeah. they disbanded, they had really not done anything except for make sure that there were buffalo that we could have to kill, um, to kill <laughs> or the, in zoos and things like that. You know, they yeah. it didn't go extinct, but they also didn't do anything to... Where on earth are they putting them 
now? Like in like national parks mm-hmm. and stuff? I think okay. so. I think they're in Yellowstone. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But don't quote me on that. Again, not just free roaming because they'd be like walking into people's, literally right. still walking into people's cattle ranches, right? Yeah. I mean, so anyway. Or backyard. Yeah. And and I, I'm sorry that I keep going off on tangents here, but all of this is so... Um, is still so um, fraught even today. Like there was the whole thing um, about reintroducing that there was an effort during this time period um, to rid wolves from Yellowstone. Right. right. And when they got rid of the wolves, the, the ecologic, what's it called? The ecology. Yeah. They didn't have their natural predators. Yeah. And so the, the park changed. It looked Mm -hmm. different. There were so many rabbits and sheep Mm -hmm. and things that they just decimated the, the wilderness. Then they reintroduce the wolves and the ecology changes again. And it goes back to kind of, you know, being full of flowers and whatever. Um, But then they have to try to keep those wolves on the park because once they go out they kill the cattle and it's the same thing with the bison right we can't we want to reintroduce them but we actually have to sort of keep them to the park because otherwise they're going to be a problem can you imagine like driving down the road and like getting a bison like that's not a good situation um i think you'd be deceased Um, (laughs) deceased um which is why we need specially trained forest rangers yeah to keep them on the park to, to do right to do these these okay. smart things right but even then Let's it's build a wall. like yeah go. build a wall around yellowstone to keep up then and in fact marissa you got me that book about that one wolf um that was like, yeah. really really famous at was at yellowstone right yeah, I think so. um was, yeah. which i have not read yet but i'm familiar with that story and it's um this all is just fascinating to me of a wolf. yeah which i like i like that mm-hmm. okay all right Another part of the effort to protect American wildlife in the late 19th century was the creation of game protection services. In other words, game wardens. In New York State, Governor Alonzo Cornell appointed the first eight men to be game protectors in 1880 and gave them the job of stopping poachers and enforcing the fledgling game laws in New York State. Some early game wardens felt that they were making a difference, but by the late 1890s, then Governor Theodore Roosevelt, who was like, <laughs> like popping everywhere. up everywhere in these episodes, um, was disappointed that the positions had essentially devolved into becoming a political patronage job mm. because they worked under the the governor. Like right. they they w- weren't part of their own agency. They actually kind of responded or reported directly to the governor. And so they were just filling the jobs with people that they liked. Um, And Roosevelt did not like this um, because men were being appointed who had no commitment to the laws they were enforcing. But even more, they were men that had no idea what they were doing. They weren't familiar with the landscape or the what they weren't capable of the rough sort of outdoor work that they were required to do. Shocking. I know. Right. And there's this famous quote from in a letter from Roosevelt to the Fisheries, Game, and Forest Commission of New York State, where he outlines what he wants from his game protectors. He says this. The men who do duty as game protectors in the Adirondacks should be by reference should by reference be appointed from the locality itself and should in all cases be thorough woodsmen. The mere fact that a game protector has to hire a guide to pilot him through the woods is enough to show his unfitness for the position. I want as game protectors men of courage, resolution, and hardihood who can handle the rifle, the axe, and paddle, who can camp out in summer or winter, who can go on snowshoes if necessary, who can go through the woods by day or night without regard to trails. The New York State game protectors morphed over the years, and when the Department of Environmental Conservation was officially created in 1970, the game wardens became environmental conservation officers. Um, And I just want to say, my dad was a was a um, was a DEC officer, and that's um, that quote from Roosevelt is exactly today what 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 game wardens still do yeah they they still do if you looked in my dad's car on any given day he would have an axe he would have a rifle um he had we had so many snowshoes we couldn't even count them like (laughs) they still do this stuff um Mm -hmm. and they have to be really really familiar with the land that they're on 
um, they kind of have to know it by like the back of their hand and they know everything about the, the wildlife. I mean, it's really incredible. All of the things that they, that they still do. I'm curious, like, cause I, I read about like when I read and Marissa, I'm wondering if you can answer this for me. Like you hear about, um, like royal forests and royal hunting mm, forests and they right. always had a game warden. Yeah. They had, um, Gamekeeper. Game That's what it is. Gamekeeper. Ding, 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 ding. Um, but yeah, it, it is interesting that there um, had traditionally been that kind of role yeah. in Europe for yeah. those private parks. And that's actually... Um, Seems like what was these early ones The were early doing. parks yeah. were doing, too, was they were hiring locals to be gamekeepers. Right. But New York State, um, in you know, starting in 1880, starts to have people doing that same role, but for public lands. Yeah. Because, like, for example, like Roosevelt's Crockett Club, you know, a lot of people actually were criticizing them because these naturalist hunters one of the reasons they were trying to preserve game was so that future generations would be able to hunt. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily for conservation's sake or for ecology reasons, right. but for being for white men being able to hunt right. later. And, right? and even now, um, some of the, the, at least in my life, some of the most ardent conservationists that you will find are hunters mm -hmm. because they're the ones that have the most intimate kind of relationship with the land and with with their game. And they want to preserve that game um, because they want to pass that tradition of right. hunting down to their kids. So it's like still that dichotomy that you were talking about at the beginning of the episode between the preservationists and the conservationists. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it still is. All right. And I should say here, too, that I apologize. I'm using the term conservationist really broadly when I think during this time period it specifically meant people like Pinchot yes. who wanted to manage the environment. Um, I don't think, like John Muir, I don't think would ever have called himself a conservationist. He was a pr preservationist. Right. right. Yeah. So I'm using those interchangeably when they're yeah. not really interchangeable. Okay. I'm sorry. I apologize, people. Sorry. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, let's move on because this is getting long. So we would be remiss to talk um, about the Gilded Age progressive era move for conservation without talking about two other motivations for protecting America's open land, wildernesses and wildlife population, manhood and health. Conservation was often spearheaded by wealthy white men, mm -hmm. mostly because they were the ones who had the luxury to escape the city and travel, whether to stay at the resort. Uh, stay at the resorts in places like the Adirondacks or Catskills or go hunting in the West. They found great relief and escape in America's wildernesses, and they did not want to see them disappear. So kind of what we were just discussing. Exactly, right. Um, of course, they also embraced conservation because they loved to hunt. Okay, so I apologize. I guess I should just... No, it's okay. I forgot that, that said that. <laughs> and losing game meant losing the you know, the enjoyment of the hunt, right? right. Um, but there was also another level. During the Gilded Age, there was something of a panic about the state of American manhood. Desk jobs and white-collar jobs, a general feeling of being removed from the land and manual labor. Between 1870 and 1920, almost 11 million rural Americans moved to cities. And between 1860 and 1900, the majority of Americans went from working in agriculture to working in industry. There was a general sense that Americans were losing touch with their more primal selves and being weakened by being sedentary, civilized, and intellectual. And many people believed that this disconnect was literally making people sick. People... Primarily white, middle, and upper class people. Yeah, almost exclusively yeah. white, middle, and upper class people, right? Started developing a nervous disorder that came to be known as neurasthenia. We might think of it today as sort of anxiety or depression. People were frustrated and feeling suffocated and unfulfilled. Right. Often, the people who got sick were those who challenged traditional notions of manhood and womanhood. Men who worked desk jobs and lost touch with their primal masculinity got sick. Women who sought lives in the public got sick. You might have heard of neurasthenia before if you've read the short story The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. In the story, the main character is a woman suffering from an intense nervous disorder. 
Her doctor, modeled off of the famous neurologist S. Weir Mitchell, prescribes her the rest cure, his patented treatment for neurasthenia. She is kept to strict bed rest, which drives her slowly mad, until she begins to see a woman trapped in the wallpaper creeping around the room. It is a horrifying feminist story about the expectations of womanhood and how the enforcement of those expectations created and still can create madness in pursuit of compliance. One of the possible reasons for ill health and the breakdown of proper gender roles, some people argued, had to do with the degradation of the very American character. In 1893, historian Frederick Jackson Turner gave a speech to the AHA, which is the American Historical Association, we're all members, Mm -hmm. uh, in which he gave an argument that the American character, the very thing that made Americans Americans, I guess we should probably say made white Americans Americans, right, in this context? Yeah, I mean, I don't think he expected explicitly says that but that certainly was embedded yes um was the existence of a frontier but he argues that frontier was now gone with the invention of barbed wire more and more frontiersmen were closing off their land effectively killing the open american frontier and embedded in his argument is this fear What will happen to Americans when there is no longer a frontier? Will American men and women go soft and weak? And for some, this seems like a clear parallel with neurasthenia. Americans are getting sick because we've lost our connection with this open space that makes us American. It's in the wilderness that we can be cured. This aligns in an interesting way with Theodore Roosevelt's own personal story. In the early 1880s, Roosevelt was an ambitious young man trying to find his break in New York state politics, but he was lampooned as effeminate, called Pumpkin Lily and Jane Dandy, (laughs) and accused of suckling on the end of a cane. Oh my. Yeah. (laughs) Roosevelt responded fiercely, telling one politician who was plotting to pull a humiliating trick on him that, quote, by God, if you try anything like that, I'll kick you, I'll bite you. I'll kick you in the balls. I'll do anything to you. You better leave me alone. <laughs> I just love Teddy Roosevelt. So he is the gift that keeps on giving, yes, isn't he? He, really he is. just shows up everywhere. <laughs> so Roosevelt had been a sickly child and he had worked very hard as a young man to change his image, um, for instance, through boxing while he was at Harvard, but it had only gone so far. Two years after his almost tussle with this politician, Roosevelt gave up his life in New York State or New York City, um, albeit temporarily, to move to South Dakota to start a cattle ranch after the death of his wife and his mother on the same night on Valentine's Day, right? Mm. Um, Being out in the wilds of the Dakotas changed his life. When he returned to New York, he was a different person, obsessed with masculinity himself and a symbol of masculinity for others. And as we know, he became intrinsic to the conservation movement, founding the club that helped to fight for an expansion of the national parks and helping to create better game warden services in New York State. He was an avid hunter and outdoorsman. And all that was tied to his ideas of masculinity. In 1899, for example, he gives a speech called The Strenuous Life, in which he outlines what it means to be an American man. You need to have the will... You need to have the willingness to work hard with your hands, fight for what is right, do your duty in the world as a white American man. What is incompatible with this strenuous life is, and this is a quote from the speech, the timid man, the lazy man, the man who distrusts his country, the over-civilized man who has lost the great fighting masterful virtues, the ignorant man, the man of dull mind. And again, um, I'm we're oversimplifying part of this in which he mentions this term, the over civilized man. That is a direct kind of pointing to social Darwinism and ideas of race during the Gilded Age and how, you know, certain races were more civilized. That Humanity's in a constant civilizing process. Mm-hmm. Some races are more civilized than others. But there was the fear that those very civilized races could over civilize and that you had to in some way keep in touch with the primal kind of center or you would kind of become weak and effeminate and and kind of die off and foppish yeah can i say something that's so weird about that is that you know they're like when um settlers first were coming here and in, in, in uh, interacting with Native Americans, like one of the things that, you know, there was that whole noble savage thing. Like, mm-hmm. oh, those kind of 
But they also thought that they were quite effeminate, too. Mm -hmm. Like, because they were, you know, didn't have hair. And so it's so weird. Like, it's so contradictory. Like, the the ideology is contradictory. Yes. Yeah. It's, like, not... Absolutely. (laughs) I mean, all of it is contradictory. I mean, there was the effort to exterminate Native Americans at the same time that people were going to see Wild Bill's (laughs) Western show Uh to see Sitting Bull, right? Like, they wanted to see it. They wanted to preserve Native Americans in the same sense that they wanted to preserve the bison. They didn't actually want them out on the, the, you know... In the wild. In the wild, actually Uh living their lives. They wanted them to be preserved in, you know, showcases at the... Pan American exposition, right. you know, where they could be viewed. They didn't want them to be extinct because they wanted to consume them in a sense. Mm-hmm. So you can't be a true American man sitting behind your desk in the city pushing papers. Right. You still need to get out and camp and kill buffalo and experience life. And so when men started being diagnosed with neurasthenia, one of the cures for them was not the rest cure, but the strenuous life. Right. So Mm -hmm. women had to go to bed. Men had to go outside. Right. Mm -hmm. In order Mm -hmm. to be healthy, you needed to be more masculine by being out in nature, just like women needed to be more feminine by being inside and in bed. Yeah. It's like the hyper extension of public private divide. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So when we what we see is a push for conservation at the same time that Americans are experiencing real anxiety about gender and the American character. For some Americans, preserving forests and creating national parks was about more than just a commitment to the environment. It was about preserving the American character and identity and saving American masculinity. Yeah, and just one last point about this is that this fear um, that Frederick Jackson Turner kind of articulates in the frontier thesis about um, Americans losing their frontier, what that does, and, and this comes up in The Strenuous Life, this is something that Teddy Roosevelt talks about a lot, is um, there are other frontiers. They're not inside the bounds of the United States. Yeah. Instead... What we need, our new frontier will be um, South America. <laughs> will be South America. Will yeah. be the Caribbean, yeah. right? Um, and so, in 1898, the Spanish American War is really informed by this desire to have Americans remasculinize mm-hmm. by going overseas and fighting a war and kind of um, doing the performing the white man's burden mm-hmm. by lifting up the you know Cubans and the Philip or the Filipinos, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so this is has really disturbing outcroppings of right. this. Right. Um, but then what I also think is wonderful, that what I what I think is actually wonderful, <laughs> that I was not wonderful. Say, yeah. What I think is actually wonderful is that what has become the frontier or, or what becomes the frontier in the 60s. I mean, Kennedy calls his view for what Americans should be doing in the 60s, the new frontier. Right. Right. And what's part of that? Space, space. exploration. Right. So when Star Trek comes out, in the it's, 60s, it's, yeah. space is the, the new final frontier, frontier yeah. right? I, 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 the way that that all interconnects to me is just really fascinating. And, of course, it has very disturbing elements, too, but mm-hmm. it's really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Teddy Roosevelt, how fucking weird was he, right? He was he, so he, interesting. He and John Muir once had a sleepover um, in Yosemite, and they stayed up all night together sitting around a campfire talking about, like, I can just imagine, like, dude, how <laughs> I great. I love you, man. <laughs> yeah, I love you. Like, how great is this national park, man? Like, how awesome is this? We need to do more to protect it, bro. And then they did. I I would, I, you know, Roosevelt probably is somebody that I would love to, I don't know if I'd want to meet him because I think he might annoy me. Mm-hmm. Like, the things that I've read about him, that he was just one of those people who never shuts never, off. Never, yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. Where you're just like, dude, finally shut up. You yeah. know, kind of thing. Like he was just going, 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 yeah. going, going, yeah. going. Um, amazing. Yeah, he's he's an incredible. He's a he's a complex <laughs> oh, person. Yeah, totally. I mean, the strenuous life is intensely racist. Yeah. Um, yeah. and he was very classist. I mean, he was not he's not great in those senses, but just a dynamic, fascinating character that just is involved in every. In, in you could study Roosevelt for in your entire career. Yeah. Right. And write one thing after another. Yeah. I have a student right now writing a paper about him and how he built up the American Navy. Right. So, I mean. Yeah. Kind of ha- one of those people who has his hand in everything. Exactly. Well, thank you, Sarah. It was an awesome episode. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Well, that does it for that episode. We've talked long enough about all these really cool things, even though I could talk about them forever. So you can find us on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play, on many other places. And if there's some place that you would like us to be that we are not, please let us know. Bye. Bye. This podcast was produced by the historians of Dig, Elizabeth Garner Masaryk, Sarah Hanley Cousins, Marissa Rhodes, and me, Abel Earls. Thanks for listening. By the time I wrote the discussion points, I'd had a couple glasses. No, I mean, I think we've discussed them. No, it's fine. Because I think, what are we at? I mean, but I wrote things like, how great are game wardens? Very great. (laughs) Very great. They're very great. Cheers. Cheers to the game wardens. And then I have one last thing that I have to say. Government's play first. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think I need a food. I need food. I think I need a food. I'm sorry. We're never going to get through this. No. I don't want to do it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's really cool. Tinder. Tinder parents. That would be a very different situation. Swipe. Loggers exhausted the hardwood of one area, then abandoned it and moved on to the next. <laughs> what? Hardwood? He exhausted the hardwood of one area and then abandoned it. And that, the and, that was, and that was what men do in Tinder Barrens. <laughs> I'm sorry, my husband just texted me and I want to rip his face off. Okay. Um, Why didn't you eat my bacon, Sarah? No, he just texted me, I want trifle. And I want to make your own goddamn trifle. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs>